you guys have co-authored a book that, I, I mean, I think it's fascinating in light of the contentious atmosphere that Washington has and it's about being unified, about finding ways to solve problems. I'm not sure there's a lot of people in Washington who are talking about what you're talking about in the book, about being unified and problem solving. Why not? I think we talk about it. We talk about it privately. Uh, Senator Scott and I both have a number of friends on the other side of the aisle. Uh, most of us get along pretty well when the cameras are off. But, Governor, we are in an environment now where winning is the only thing that matters. Hmm. And uh, they want President Trump to be a one-term president. They want to beat him whenever he's up for re-election. It's all about being the speaker or having the committee uh, chair gavels in your hand. And, uh, I mean, I hate to beat up on the media, although I'm happy to come back on another time <laughs> and do that. I'll go ahead. Uh, beat him up. Okay. <laughs> Since it. you insist. Um, <laughs> You know, this, this should be an investigation about what Russia did to us, but it is an obsession with collusion for which no evidence has been presented except You've seen Adam no Schiff. evidence, and you've seen a lot of stuff that we haven't seen. There's no member of Congress who's seen more than I have, and trust me, if collusion evidence existed, Adam Schiff would have leaked it a long time ago. <laughs> so then they pivoted to obstruction of justice, um, and now, as Senator Scott pointed out, they're looking at public tweets. Um, I, I think defending this country from foreign attacks is very unifying. When it gets into trying to delegitimize someone who won the, won the Electoral College, that's where the division comes in. Yeah. All right, Senator, you, the book is unified, and it talks about your personal friendships with each other. Yeah. Um, why is that important to you, to have the kind of friendship and, and relationship with a congressman that you guys have? Yeah, we both come from the deep south, South Carolina. And when we were born, growing up as kids, we would not have been able to play together. We would not have been able to go to the same restaurant or sleep in the same hotels. But so much has changed. And our country sometimes is fixated on the things that divide us. And one of the things that we saw after the Charleston shooting mm. is that God blessed us to live, breathe, and evolve in South Carolina. And our state has evolved in such tremendous ways that after a racially motivated shooting, the leaders of the state came together black and white, joining hands, uniting our state and I believe our nation after nine family members came forward and forgave the killer of their family. If we can unite and be unified after such an atrocity, there's hope everywhere. Congressman, that event was seminal in South Carolina. But what happened in South Carolina, rather than riots and fights and divisions, was people came together for reconciliation. Why was it different there? I don't know, but it sure was. And it uh, not only affected, I mean, lay politics aside, from a faith standpoint, from all the things that matter in life, to have nine people who, who, who did exactly what Jesus told them to do. Welcome in a stranger. Mm -hmm. We're going to pray with you. We're going to pray for you. And the whole time he is sitting there knowing, knowing with malice aforethought that I am going to kill as many of you as I possibly can. Mm -hmm. You talk about premeditated capital penalty eligible murder. And the very first thing the family members do is say, I forgive you. Mm. I could not do it. Um, I would not do it. And mm. that may make me a bad Christian and so be it. Uh, but they did it. And they looked into the, to the eyes of a man who wanted to start a race war in my state. Mm. And because of the way they responded to a tragedy that most of us cannot fathom, it had exactly the opposite impact. And Senator, you're from the Low Countries. Charleston's your home. Absolutely. My uh, uncle, <clears throat> my uncle attended that church for 50 plus years. Mm -hmm. And Clemente Pinckney, the pastor of the church, was was a friend of mine. And uh, I remember the first text that he had sent me. Uh, he was one of the first people to call me Senator mm -hmm. back in 2012, December. And uh, he wanted tickets to the president, President Obama's inauguration. And I also have the, the last tweet that he didn't answer. No. Are you and your parishioners okay? Mm. To watch my community come together and 
demonstrate to the world that life can be better with hope in Jesus. That nine family members whose lives had not been interrupted, but devastated, did not come forth with anger, but they remembered somehow in the midst of their challenges, in the depth of their loss, they remembered Matthew 5:44. They remembered the concept of loving your enemies hmm. and praying for those who persecute you. And when that happened, I think 36 hours, it happened 36 hours after the murder, the murders, to have one member after another member after another member come alive on a screen looking into the killer's eyes. The world stopped and said, what just happened in Charleston? Hmm. The place where the Civil War started in Charleston. And you saw the coverage on newspapers and TV screens that forgiveness, I think, evaded an eruption and instead became the salve that heals the wound. Uh, I spoke with uh, Daniel Simmons Jr., whose father was murdered that day. A week after the murder, I was going on the Senate floor to talk about it. And he, I said, sir, is there anything you want me to share? And he said, with enthusiasm and energy, he said, yes, please share Romans 8, 28, that somehow, some way, all these things work, work, will work together for good, for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. I was flabbergasted. I mean, the people of Charleston, and specifically that church, probably gave the greatest lesson to America in my lifetime of grace, forgiveness, reconciliation. The book that you guys have put together is really um, an analysis, not just of the Charleston shooting, but of the broader, more universal need for a unity in America, for friendship, for people getting to know each other as the two of you have. Uh, maybe it may seem like you're unlikely cohorts, but you've developed a tight, close bond. Why can't that happen more often in politics? It can, um, and uh, you know, we do have differences. Some, some <laughs> folks say, well, you're both from South Carolina, you're both Republicans, what could you possibly not have in common? Uh, we don't do our hair the same way. Now, let me just say <laughs> to your audience, <laughs> Please explain to me how this happened. <laughs> yeah, literally, I don't, know, I don't fully understand that. Divine but intervention. Uh, Divine intervention, he said. All right. We have different faith perspectives. We have different perspectives on political issues. Uh, contrast is good. I enjoy contrast. Conflict is debilitating. And, and, and I think most of my fellow citizens know the difference between I pull for the Cowboys, you pull for the Giants or the Packers, and having a fractured relationship where you question the motives, the patriotism, and everything else and someone with whom you disagree, we got to find a way uh, to dial down the conflict. Would we do better if we turned the cameras off in Washington more often, didn't televise as many things, didn't give people a sense that they had to go in front of the cameras and, and, and preen and, and, and make their points before TV for their audiences to get all revved up? Absolutely, positively, unequivocally, yes. Mm. There's no doubt that if the cameras were off, you'd have more real people having real conversations that lead to real progress. I got a great idea. We'll just get rid of the cameras in Washington. We'll have everybody watch my show on television, on TVN, and there you go. I second that motion. Is there a, a great uh, idea? We'll <laughs> introduce the bill when we go back. <laughs> yes, sir. I want to thank both of you. My, my heartfelt thanks to Senator Tim Scott, Congressman Trey Gowdy. On this 4th of July weekend, we should all pray that the same spirit that captured the hearts of the great people of South Carolina will bring us together to find our solutions with police reform, the COVID challenge, and anything else that may come our way as a nation. All right, Keith Bilbrey, why don't you tell everybody how to get a copy of Senator Scott and Representative Gowdy's powerful book. Well, you can get your copy of Unified, How Our Unlikely Friendship Gives Us Hope for a Divided Country at Amazon or wherever books are sold while you're at it. 
Order a copy of The Friendship Challenge, a six-week guide to true reconciliation, one friendship at a time.